Do you know the common denominator between all those movies? Well, let me tell you about Phil Nibbling, who was key in the making of those movies. After working for 10 years at Disney as a character animator, Nibbling then ventured to other roles, such as storyboard artist and film director. But today, we will not review his early career, nor his 10 years under Spielberg as an animation director, but rather focus on Romeo and Juliet, sealed with a kiss. It's more than an animation movie with a play and word title. It's the apogee of his career as an animator. Released in 2006, the Shakespeare adaptation was Nibbling's solo adventure. The one-man movie has been written, animated, and directed by Phil alone, and it took four and a half years to be produced. Even voiceovers were even recorded in his basement, performed by himself, his friends, and his daughter. 112,000 frames, all drawn by Nibbling on a Wacom tablet directly into Flash 4 in combination with Moho software. If we're ignoring the poor Photoshop done on this TV set, look at this happy man, surrounded by this dream setup screaming early 2000. But why am I telling you all of this? You can find it all online. Well, what you can't find online though is this. One at an auction in Los Angeles, the lot included an unusual film printer, as well as the computer and software suite required to make it run. And yes, you're right. These are the very machines that can be seen in Phil's production basement. We can spot the film printer hidden here, this monitor on that shelf, and the computer tower right here. So this is an amazing acquisition, and because you're on this channel, I thought you would be interested in discovering what are those machines still used in 2006 on which Romeo and Juliet Sealed with a Kiss was made, and explore the hard drive in an attempt to maybe recover some long forgotten data. Let's explore the film printer. If you want to understand the basics of film printing, I would recommend to check my previous video I made on the MGI Solitaire 16, a much sturdier and bigger film printer. By the way, this is a perfect segue for me to invite you to subscribe to this channel and leave a comment if you like. It really helps visibility for small channels like this one, and it's a good indicator for me to know if you like this type of content. This 4K film printer was sold as a Phoenix from Upgrade Technology. But the sticker on the machine is referring to a QCR from Matrix Instruments. A bit confusing. Created in 1976, IMAPRO got acquired in 1986 by the ACFA division of Bayer Corporation and released their first high-resolution film recorder in 1979. By 1981, they were selling 4K 24-bit film printers and kept being in the business selling the Matrix line of film printers and even had a 32K film printer by 1994. Opening the hood reveals a very simple construction. Two boards on a backplane, only there to provide the power rails. The main board is hosting the processing unit, a Zilog Z180, it's the successor of the Z80 CPU, and is most likely cadence at 10 MHz. We can also spot a bunch of complex programmable logic devices. The National Instruments chip on the left is the GPIB interface gate. The board design and manufacturing probably dates back to January 1995 if we refer to the silk screen markings. Also note that the unit may have been customized or calibrated for nibbling as many parts are labeled nib. The main ROM in U7 is a 27C512, a standard 64K EEPROM in which both the system and LUT profiles are stored. The second board is hosting many analog device components, and it's most likely where all the digital image is converted to analog. I couldn't see a brand for the well-shielded black and white CRT, but probably a state-of-the-art component. By the tube's neck is the deviation board, recognizable by the vertical and horizontal power transistors and adjustment trim pots. Finally, the video driver board is taking an analog signal using a coax signal from the main board. The front panel is pretty boring and probably using off-the-shelf boards. Also from that auction was a box of goodies, in which can be found a reminder on how to lay out the film in the Oxberry head, a floppy disk, an eyepiece for focus calibration, some spare fuses, and some EEPROMs containing previous LUT profiles, as well as a calibration pattern on 35mm film, and some other spare parts. Just for legacy, I am backing up all the EEPROMs, and will attempt to decipher what address contains the LUT profiles should we need to adjust those values. I think it is a bit of an oversight that the system and the LUTs are stored on the same chip, but probably a cost-saving decision. 
Similar to other film printers, the Phoenix is using Oxberry modules that can be swapped depending on the film type you want to print on. And if you're interested, this is what it looks inside the exposure chamber. Cogs and wheels and shiny frame advance mechanism. Now let's have a look at the computer that was used to render the movie. We do have a Pentium 3 running at 750 MHz with a single 128 RAM stick. It's booting Windows NT4. Luckily, the access is granted without a password, and we now have a simple desktop featuring the main softwares used for the movie production. Flash 4, Moho, and Raster Plus, a very unique software designed to control most popular film printers. The amazing surprise was when I found files browsing the hard drive. I have been able to load Flash 4 animation from the movie, and this is truly unexpected and amazing. Look at this! Those are the original drawings and animation files from the movie. And being mostly vector-based, this means I am able to render and export the frames to any resolution. Let's try a 4K render and make a test print. I will need to install this physical security dongle. Each frame is rendered in three successive passes, red, green, and blue. This is what it looks like. A 4K print on 35mm film takes roughly a minute and a half, and if you're curious, this is a long exposure on DSLR, as I don't have any film on hand. One color at a time, and then combined. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed exploring some cool artifacts of movie history. And as usual, thanks for watching.